Hey everyone, I'm Jessica Flaherty from the Herring Center and Cassie Martin is also here with us from the team. I'm excited to have a conversation about school community and family partnerships with a school team that I really find so unique and endearing. Uh, it's Brennan K through eight. We have Trish here with us, Brittany and Alicia, but I'll let them introduce themselves in a minute. Before that, before we get into it, I kind of want to give a quick rundown of the Demo Sites project. So in the fall of 2019, OSPI partnered with the Herring Center to coordinate and lead a part of a larger statewide project, which is designating and partnering with model demonstration sites like Brennan that highlight inclusionary practices across Washington state. The goal is to provide Washington educators the opportunity to observe inclusionary practices in action, meet with school teams, access resources, and learn about how to implement inclusionary practices in different schools contexts. We want to showcase schools like Brennan in a way that shares their knowledge, but also in a way that makes social and professional connections with other educators. So if after listening to this chat, you feel pulled to get in touch with Brennan or with any one of our other demo sites, we strongly encourage you to do so. We'd actually love to help make that happen. Our webpage has a link that'll help you access or visit or even contact a school team, um, along with a lot of other great resources on our website. So I, I urge you to check it out. Before we start the conversation, I wanna highlight how much I love this word cloud. This came into existence following Brennan's last presentation. We asked the attendees to enter one word that sums up the message they were taking away. And I wanna share this because I, I think it really represents why family and community partnerships is such a great thing for Brennan, the Brennan team to share. Family and community partnerships are really an important part of working towards a more equitable school setting and system. And I really think y'all do it so well. And this word cloud shows me that other people are thinking that too. So I wanted to give a little praise before I pass things over to y'all, but I'd love to go ahead and do that um, and Trish, I, I would love for you to give us a little bit about Brennan as a place and, and Brennan as a school. And maybe I'll share these couple of slides that have really great pictures of Brennan. Yeah, I love that. Yes. Um, well, it's hard to talk about what we do at Brennan without really understanding what makes Brennan so unique. Um, I had never been in a place as small as Brennan in my long career until we moved to our summer cabin here and I uh, went to work at Brennan, but I am the principal and superintendent of the Brennan School District. I also add often midday no nose wiper and toilet plunger to the list. Um, we have about 80 students in transitional kindergarten through eighth grade. And then we have about two grades uh, in each classroom. Um, Brennan is located in the southern part of the Jefferson of Jefferson County on the Olympic Peninsula, um, and as you can see, it's by these photos. It's just a stunningly beautiful place with elk herds. We're right along the Hood Canal. It's just uh, it's it's pretty spectacular. Um, it's very tiny. We have two restaurants, a gas station, and a small general store. We're not even big enough to warrant a stoplight. We have two places that are that people come to visit and the, the, the locals also enjoy. And that would be the Whitney Gardens and the Pleasant Harbor Marina Resort. Um, so when you look at these pictures, it's just spectacular and beautiful, but behind the scenes, there's a lot of poverty. Um, we have beautiful waterfront homes and lots of snowbirds come and uh, come back and forth between here and places like Arizona, but we also have lots of poverty up in the mountains and in the hills. Um, we are an hour from really an hour drive from any type of service, whether it's a grocery store, whether it's uh, health or mental health services, we're an hour drive from any of that. Um, that's a bit of a barrier for our families. Also transit is, does service Brennan, but if you want to go to the grocery store or to a doctor's appointment, you have to get on the transit at like 8.30 in the morning and you don't get to come home till four or five in the afternoon. So you, it's a day trip for you. Um, so it, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's also, you know, it also provides, you know, it also presents some challenges. Um, so I, I did want to mention real quick as a mom also, <laughs> um, you know, my name is Brittany. I teach middle school math and science. I also have three kids in the school and I do um, some special education 
resourcing and I also do some IT support sometimes. <laughs> but as a mom, you know, the remoteness of Brennan makes it extremely challenging. As one example, I have one son who's taking tuba lessons down in Shelton, that's as close as we could get it. And another son who's doing baseball, who usually ends up going to the Northern Jefferson County areas to do his games. So on Thursday, I'm literally split in two directions. And so sometimes I rely on another mom to take my son to baseball, or sometimes my other son doesn't get to go to tuba, or you know, if the right falls through, then one of them just doesn't get to do what they're supposed to do because I can't go one hour in one direction, come back and then go an hour in the other direction and try and pick them all up. I can't just drop them off around town and come back and pick them up. You know, it's, it's literally limiting your options of what you can do. And if you have more than three kids, if you have a, a, a dentist appointment and a doctor's appointment in different places or even in the same place, it just, it takes all day. So it is really challenging to try and get resources or services anywhere outside of Brennan. And as Trish said, most of them are outside of Brennan. I love that you added that. I think that really highlights why it's so important to hear you all talk about this, because I, I can't, if I'm trying to pull examples of other schools that I've seen highlighted that are similar to you, I, I can't think of any. I can't, I can't really think of times that I've heard people talk about this and share this but I can think of times where I've known that they have needed the help with it. So. so we know how accessible resources are in your community, which is incredibly so, right? Very easy to access. Um, so if, if they're hard to go out and get, it's important to bring them in. How, what are some ways that you're bringing community resources in and what's that relationship like? Um, you know, we've worked really hard at that because we know that if, for instance, a child needs counseling, the odds that they're gonna get regular counseling services if they're at least an hour away are, are fairly unlikely. Um, so when I first came to Brennan six or seven years ago, I, I, did, I just plopped down here and I didn't even know what made Brennan special different other than it was little. Mm -hmm. But um, what, what I tried to do and to teach the staff to do is become an expert at telling our story. I mean, um, you, you, you can't ask for resources if you don't have a reason or a story. So, and we kind of boil it down to really, you know, a few bullet points. Um, we have the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch on the Olympic Peninsula and also in Kitsap and uh, Clallam, that whole area. We have the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch. Uh, kids qualify for that. Um, we, uh, we, we have a really hard time getting data points because we're so little, they won't, they won't tease that data out. But um, the last uh, points that I saw said that we also had the highest percentage of child abuse cases accepted for investigation. And we had the highest percentage of families qualifying for TANF, which is temporary assistance for needy families. So we, when, we, when I go out, I tell that story. So, and then I have to just get out there. You know, we start locally. And we do things like um, seeing at the senior holiday meals and we invite the Dosey Wallops Park Camp Rangers to come to the school and teach summer school lessons and then teach lessons with the kids. We, we take field trips to, the, to Camp Parsons, which is the Boy Scout camp. We make field trips to the fire station. We take our eighth graders to the local restaurant to have pie as a reward. Um, so we try to make sure we're plugging into the community. Um, and then we, the other thing that we've really had to do is just get active in the county, not just sit in Brennan only. Um, mm -hmm. I had to really sort of seek out who are the players here? Who do, and I need, I need to get to know them. The other thing I really had to look at is I didn't know what other districts have. What do they have that we don't, you know? Um, so I had to pay really close attention. What a, what a quill scene in Chimicum and Port Townsend and what do all those schools have that we don't have? Um, so, and, and then how, how do they get them? Where do they come from? And, um, and are they getting them for free? And then why not us? So I started to just sort of plug into some local organizations. I became involved with the Community Health Improvement Plan, that program. Um, and through that relationship with those people, 
we got a $46,000 grant for a walking path that's, that's on our property now, our school property. And we have the run club and the kids are out there walking and the community's out there walking. Matter of fact, in the time of COVID, we, uh, we take Zoom meetings on our phones and walk while we're, while we're doing that. Um, I began to realize when I looked that we didn't have anything provided to us for summers and every other school district around us did. So I got to know the YMCA, introduced myself to their staff and their people. Um, and now they provide summer meals and summer literacy programs for us. And they had not been doing that. Um, I never even knew there was such a thing as 4-H. Oh, I knew 4-H, but I didn't know about WSU extensions. And um, I began to realize other people have after school programs and we don't have any. Um, so how are they getting that? Where's it coming from? Well, it's coming from there. So I got to know those people. And, um, and, I, and when I get to know them, I tell our story. And then um, it become, becomes kind of difficult when you tell that story to just let it sit there and not offer anything when other people's stories are a little less compelling. So now we not we lost this during COVID, but it's coming back that we have um, three days a week of after school programming, which Alicia uh, managed for us. And uh, and we had so many kids, they had to keep hiring extra people. We only have 80 students, but you know, two thirds of them came to the after school program where in other school districts, they have hundreds of kids and 12 of them come. So, uh, so that was a great service for us. I yeah, our, um, Trish just wanted to say our 4-H program um, before COVID hit, I had two assistants and 48 kids signed up for our program. Um, and I know that Quilstein had, I, I want to say 12 to 15. Um, now we didn't have 48 kids every day because we had three days and they were kind of um, divided out so that we could hit what the kids wanted to do. So there was a sports day, there was a more of a sciencey day and, and a little more open free day so that the kids could come and feel like they could get involved in what they wanted, were interested in. Um, but yeah, there was 48 kids registered. And when we started this school year this year, that was the main question I heard no matter where I went in the school, is there gonna be 4-H this year? And I was sad to say, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that. I was just going to mention, Trish, I love it when you share that because you've talked about that a lot, like with the dental services, with other things coming into your town. Well, they're like, but you're so small, you know, what do we, but everyone comes like it's this resource that everyone takes advantage of. So your number is actually greater than in some larger communities because everyone is really accessing those services. That well, are and Cassie, the key there is that when we have these opportunities, in order for people to feel like they are worthwhile to present these opportunities and that, you know, we are utilizing them, the school does a really great job of calling every family when I first moved in, right? And I, I had seen completely different areas than this as well. When I first moved in and, and I had the office administrator call our family before we'd even attended school and said, hey, we have this summer school program. I see you're registered for the fall. Does your kids wanna to come to summer school? And I my, my actual question to her was, well, isn't that just for students who need extra help? <laughs> you know, my kids don't need extra help. And she's like, no, 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 no. This is open to everybody. That's another thing we do really well. Any program we bring in, open to everybody. Most of the time, there's no qualifications needed. If we have a summer program, you're invited. If we have a preschool program, you're invited. You don't have to have an IEP or be qualified for special education to come to our preschool. Everyone is invited and we call every family and we encourage them to come and help them feel welcome to come to everything that we do. And, and our Brit office spends a lot of time with that. I say, Brittany goes the opposite way too, right? So you talked about, you don't have to have a need to come, but also if you do have a need, you're also included, right? Exactly. So and that's, that's the default for inclusive practices is it's open for everybody. Universal design means everybody is welcome. Nobody feels different. We're all coming. We're all welcome. And it helps everybody. And especially those that really need it. Yeah. You know, one of the big areas we saw uh, uh, for us, it was a gap, a huge gap was counseling services. You know, when you live this far away, you're absolutely not going to get to regular counseling. It's just not going to happen. Um, so I began to kind of peek around and see why, why do these other districts have counselors and we do not. So um, we got to know those organizations. I now serve on the mental health advisory board for our, for our uh, county. And now we have four days a week of counseling at our little place and we pay for one of them. The rest are coming to us for free. 
but that's part of telling your story, being persistent, getting to know the players. Um, uh, we, uh, we work with just organizations like the Department of Energy, uh, Emergency Management. You know, they're giving, they're flooding us with COVID supplies and doing vaccination clinics. I'm, I joined the West Sound STEM Network and ended up being on that board as well. And they provide high quality professional development for our teachers. And that's hard to find out here, we're far. And they're even looking at building a satellite office here now. Um, and they also provide internships for our students. Um, you know, I've worked with the library, getting, you know, just getting to know those people and talking with them and going to their coffees and their meetings and their events at Finn River, you know, winery. Um, and they've uh, been great about bringing the bookmobile out regularly. They have a beautiful story walk set up on our walking path where kids can walk the story and talk the story. Um, locally, I've been invited to speak at organizations and I, uh, and when I speak locally, I always tell our story as well. Um, I just keep saying, we're here, don't forget us. Here's our story. Um, the other thing we've really gotten good at that I think helps is we really do a nice job of saying thank you to people. I mean, um, when an organization does something for us and for our students, our kids don't just write thanks on a piece of pink paper and send it. They're drawing pictures and the middle school does a really great job with this. They write, you know, a three paragraph essay about why it was so important and why we appreciate it so much. And I think that is a really good, it's a great lesson for the children to learn that. And it's also a really great thank you to the people that are doing things, it gives them a good feeling. So anyway. Can I ask a follow up really quick? What do you see as the impact of those, the mental health and counseling services on your community? Were people taking advantage of it? Did people see that as transformative? Oh, yeah. Did it open up conversations? <laughs> Yeah. I have four boys at home, six kids and all, but four that are still at home. Um, and all four of my boys have had um, counseling opportunities. Um, my Two of my boys have gone through Discovery Behavioral, which is way out in Fort Townsend. And so that was more of like once a month, maybe, if we were lucky and we could, could schedule it together because, you know, they have banker hours and it takes 45 minutes to get out there, which means, you know. Um, so having MCS counseling there, um, my, well, he's 11 now, but at the time he was nine, um, was suicidal <laughs> um, and actually had tried to kill himself um, without me realizing that's what he was actually doing. Um, and MCS just picked up and took him in and he was getting to talk to a counselor every week in a safe place. He was, you know, it wasn't this um, industrial, you know, sterile environment of going to discovery behavior, which, you know, nothing against them, but that's how it is. Um, but he was in his school where he felt safe with people he felt safe with. And MCS was there to come and get him. And he was able, night and day changes in his behavior. He went from being one of the students that other kids kind of shied away from um, because he would get upset and, and pound his desk um, to now, you know, he's wanting to give hugs when it's appropriate. Um, you know, he wants to say, hi, how are you doing? How's your day going? I mean, this is a kid who two years ago, that wasn't happening. He wasn't talking to anybody. And I will uh, say, I actually teach him in middle school. Yeah. And I saw him on the playground. I knew this would be a proud mommy moment. So, you know, <laughs> as a teacher and mom connection, right? I took a picture of him on the playground playing. They were playing, they were playing one of their video games in real life. And he was kind of in front of the line and he had this big old grin on his face. So I took a picture of all the kids lined up. They were playing their game. He had a big old grin on his face and I sent it to her and I said, I thought you might appreciate this. He's having a great day, you know, just yeah. fun little news notice that, you know, here's the status of your kid. Right. So that was kind of a fun. And one. you know, and you don't get that in a huge, in a huge school district. I mean, we came from a huge school district and white river over in Pierce County and they, there are so many kids and there's so much going on and none of the teachers would have had my cell phone number to say, Hey, look at this difference in this child of yours. I've seen the difference. I know you've seen the difference. And my heart melted. It was like, it put a smile. I was having kind of a hard day and it really made the difference. Have, knowing that not only am I seeing the changes and I'm caring about my family, 
but Brittany cares about my family. Yeah. Trish cares mm -hmm. about my family. Mm -hmm. So when things are happening, good or bad, um, I know, you know, I mean, it is, I have to admit when I walk into the school and all four of my kids have been in to see Trish that day, it's a little rough, <laughs> but I do know also that they're not going to be going home feeling defeated because Trish always ends the time visits in her office with, I know you can do better because I believe in you. And, you know, let's just, let's just do better from here point forward. Um, and and you, know, you don't get that in the big schools. One other point I wanted to bring out that she mentioned is having the services here on site not only helps them feel more safe in that environment, more willing to open up to counselors, but also it helps them generalize those skills, those recovery skills that they're learning and those, um, those self-regulation um, skills that they're learning with their counselor that helps them generalize them into the classroom. They're already in school, they're already on site. Okay, I just learned this, I'm gonna now try it in my classroom because I'm heading right back to my class. Yeah. And it helps them integrate better into the classroom when they have that so close. And Brittany, you know, if, if you were doing a dissertation on that topic, I, when I first stepped in here six years ago, um, I saw that the discipline referrals were in binders. There was a stack of them. They're about this thick. There's, and, and there are 80 kids. That's all. And, um, and when we did the analysis of, you know, that we do for OSPI, we were way skewed on special ed. And now the discipline file is this little bitty file. It's maybe this thick and maybe it's 12 referrals or something. It's, it's the whole atmosphere has changed. The office used to be packed and crazy and referrals. And we had pinks and blues and yellow ones. And they were categorized and it's a totally different atmosphere. Um, so I think the mental Thank health has done a lot with that. For sure. I love that you two both, that Brittany came back to um, the point of having the counseling in the school, because I think as educators, we speak so much about the least restrictive environment. We focus on it a lot in academics and in placement, but I don't see it focused so much in behavioral or social emot emotional based type of learning. Yeah. And so like that's coming up a lot in my head of like, this is so important and also kind of come then you kind of hit it home with the discipline point of like, look at, this is our evidence of we are all experiencing and feeling it and we're seeing it as well. Um, and then Alicia hit on the fact that not only do you take a strengths-based approach in academics, you take a strengths-based approach in social emotional as well. No one leaves your office feeling bad. We leave our office, you know, your office feeling empowered to, you know, I can do this. This is a joint shared responsibility, all of us, student, teacher, mom, we're all in it together type things. What, that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. So, and, and I've, I know we've hit on this a, a lot already, but I haven't said it directly, but how have community resources allowed you to build an inclusive system and structure? So, we have talked, we've told everything that we've been saying absolutely answers this question, but how would you connect the way that you access your community resources and the way that it builds an inclusive system in your school? How are those connected for you? So um, as teachers and educators, administration, everybody, we have to assume that part of our job is making sure kids are ready to learn. A lot of the reasons mm -hmm. they don't stay in the classroom or they get, you know, they get referrals or they get pushed out is because of behaviors that stem from the fact that they're not ready to be there academically, socially, emotionally, whatever's going on with their little heads, they can't focus on it, they can't access it, right? And so our job as educators is what is going on with these kiddos? You know, we do check-ins every day when they come in the classroom, what's going on and what do they need? Can I provide it? Do they need it from somewhere else? Sometimes it's not an immediate fix. Like a lot of these social emotional issues are really deep seated issues. We come from high poverty. So many of our kids have PTSD, have mental disabilities, have trauma, have things going on. They don't have a stable place to live. We have students that live in trailers or that live in, you know, tents. In some cases, they're in between homes or live with a friend's house. They're sleeping on the couch of their mom's friend, 
that in itself is trauma. But then you pop it with some of the other experiences, some extreme domestic violence cases, like Trish said, highest rate for, for cases that are investigated for domestic abuse, right? And that extends to our kids. There is so much going on with them. Do they have clean jackets? Do they have clean clothes? Are they mentally here? A lot of times that answer is no. Okay, so what do they need? How can I help them? A lot of our teaching goes towards getting them ready to learn. And we can't just assume we can show up and give them academics and they're gonna take it and move on with their day. It just doesn't work like that. So many of these resources coming in are what we prioritize is our students really, really need this. We really, really need the mental health. We really, really need after school programs. Let me tell you what those do. So having a student feel like they're included in the school and part of our school family means they're feeling successful. They're feeling empowered. They're feeling like they want to be here. Some of these mm -hmm. after school activities, you say, oh, well, they're just playing a game or playing sports or they're just making crafts or whatever. But no, these students are coming together as the same intact school group. They're creating these beautiful things. They're learning a skill in sports. They're working together as a team. And when they come back into class the next day, they're talking about what they did in 4-H or they're talking about, you know, what they did in their swimming lesson or whatever was going on at the time, right? And so then they're feeling included in the school and part of the school. And so now they're here with everybody else. Oh, we have to learn math. Oh, math sucks. But everyone's there together, bemoaning <laughs> math <laughs> and learning it together because that's what your job is. Right now, everybody's learning math. So everybody, let's focus. So then they're included in the school. They're included in the class and they're working as hard as they can. And, and, and we do a lot of growth mindset in math and the mistakes are okay. And let's try a different way and things like that. So everybody has easy access to curriculum. They can go as high as they can. And, you know, basically inclusion means everybody together, whatever that means. We're a big school family. Sometimes it's a little ugly <laughs> and sometimes it's beautiful. And so we just kind of take the good with the bad and we, we go with it and we, we teach what we can that day. And some days, I'll be honest, some days it's like, oh my gosh, my lesson is not working. I have to throw it out. We're going to do something else completely different, probably not as productive, but it's not happening today. <laughs> so you have to adjust. You have to see where the kids are. You have to be where the kids are yeah. and bring them along as, as best you can. So and Brittany, can I um, just sure. to clarify, and you guys don't have separate classes, right? All students are learning together. Correct. We, we're fully inclusive. We don't have pullouts. As we have a couple of really critical ones, students that just absolutely need some extra supports, but not many. We don't have separate intact special ed classrooms. All of the special ed education happens inside the classroom. So students with IEPs are in the class with everybody else. If we need extra support, if they need more than a teacher can give attention to that one student because she's got 30 in the class or 20 in the class, however many we have, then we have extra supports. And, you know, Trish has talked in the past about bringing in Washington Reading Corps, bringing in paras when needed, bringing in people instead of big curriculum books that the kids have to go through, you know, bring in people to help support those students in the classroom so they stay in the classroom. And you have to get really creative with that funding, but Trish has done a fantastic job with that. Well, and I have to say as a parent of a child, so my 13 year old who is also in one of Brittany's middle school classes, when we moved here four years ago, he had came with, he had been in speech since he was three. By the time he got into kindergarten and first grade, he had IEPs for reading and math because nobody spoke countries, you know? And so he had to learn how to get this brilliant brain of his to his mouth that other people could understand. So when we came to Brennan, he was being pulled, originally had been being pulled out for math and reading, plus taking speech services. Um, so we got here when he was in third grade, he still had all these IEPs. By the time I think we got to halfway into fourth grade, he was able to drop his reading IEP. He was willing to, able to drop his uh, math IEP. He just graduated out of speech last year and he is getting straight A's in all of his classes. He is highly a leader. He's a leader. Yeah, he is highly capable and he, is just it's amazing the difference between my you know <laughs> my little boy who has always been 110 percentile in height and stuff so everybody thinks he's older but he's not um this little boy who was sad and scared because he was getting pulled in all these directions now is is a kid who can 
get straight A's and call mom on it and say, hey, I want to get paid for my A's, which I'm doing because um, I want to see those A's. Um, and he's, he's like Trish was saying, he's a leader. He cares about everybody, you know, and so he's always there if there's somebody who needs encouragement or whatever. You know, and I don't think that I think that if we would have been still in the bigger school districts, there would not be that relationship because being where we are, it's relationships. We know the people and their families and we know stories and we and even with knowing these stories, we don't we don't use it as a way to put somebody down or separate them out. We bring them in because they need that you you need that support, you know. And, and I think and, I think what Alicia's story highlights is that pullouts have never been effective. And when when Trish first got here in the school, she saw that she saw so many pullouts. These kids weren't learning; they weren't keeping up. Because what happens? With pullouts, you essentially pull them away from the grade level core content experts who are the teachers, and yeah. you put them in a classroom with other students who aren't motivated to learn, and you end up with these huge behavior struggles. When I first started here, I was a special ed teacher as well, and I saw that same thing. I'm like, okay, well, let's do a pullout, and you know, it doesn't matter how quickly you make the title of the class or what kind of fun activities you do in the class, they're still, you know, it's still different. It's still out of the main classroom. They still don't want to learn. It's just not going to be successful. And so by keeping the students in the class with their core content experts and then bringing in your special education learning experts to help them learn it better, you're kind of dividing it in a more appropriate way. They're still getting the core content from the expert. They're still, and they get additional learning supports from your learning expert, the, the special education resource that can help them learn in a different way or help them access materials in a different way, or help you know support if needed during individual work time or whatever that particular student needs. And the key is knowing what each individual student needs. And small schools have a little advantage there because yes. we get to have, I get to teach students in middle school for four years in a row. They're in my first you know two year class because we swap with English language arts. And then you know after two years there, then they're graduating to the older two year class and we, you know, so we really get to know the students. Other teachers have their students for two years, sometimes three years. So, you know, you really know your students, you know what, how they learn, you know what they need. Well, I think an example with the um, discipline binders, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, our little school won a really important OSPI award um, that showed that our state testing through our state testing, we were closing out opportunity gaps for our, particularly our special ed kids. They um, they were really coming to the table and learning and making amazing progress. And um, so I think that shows that this is working. It's like Brittany really said, it's hard and it's not always pretty and we're kind of pivoting and changing, but it, it works. I feel like I can always count on Brittany to hit on the point, which is like the first point I ever took away from a Brennan meeting that felt really strong for me is that like the way you address student needs, we are not just addressing um, academic needs. We're addressing all, like all student needs. Our students are humans, they're people, um, and they have needs beyond you know what we all usually focus on. So I want to give like a name and a visual to that that I got from y'all, which is this right here. This really stood out to me. It was coming to my brain as you were talking a, a minute ago, Brittany, about do you have a clean jacket? Are you here? Do you feel safe and ready? Have you slept? Um, and then also, then you started talking about, well, no, I, we want everyone to be in, in the same room, which, which goes up to that yellow belonging, loves and needs. So you started there at the bottom and you started moving your way up. So this framework that Brennan works on for the way we're gonna address our students as, as this like people first. This is, we're dealing with little people. And so I just wanted to kind of touch on that real quick and give a, a name and a visual to it. Precisely. We use this a lot in our teaching. Like where are we at on our hierarchy of needs? Like are we you know, safe? Do we feel included? You know, do we have the confidence right now to start learning? Okay, let's go. You know, let's actualize this learning and see where we can get today. Absolutely. So if, um, in terms of advice for other schools, whether they're kind of schools like you or schools bigger than you, 
what would you recommend with starting efforts kind of in the area of con connecting with your community? Um, I'm taking away that it, it's a relationship. Yeah. You got to learn, you know, so what would you, what would you give there? Well, I guess for me, I would say, you know, at my level is get out there. I can't sit mm -hmm. in this office of mine and expect things just to come to Brennan and plop and in, plop into the school. Um, it takes time. It takes a lot of effort. Um, it takes a lot of working after hours, but it's worth it. I mean, our kids have just, you know, they have so many more opportunities than they would have had otherwise. Um, and then open your eyes, look to see what's around you. What are, what are other neighboring districts getting and where, where is it coming from? Then go after it, you know, tell your story, go after it. Mm -hmm. um, don't just quietly accept that they're only going to go to this district and not yours. Go to meetings that you don't think apply to you. Accept invitations from committees and boards carefully, but do it. Um, mm -hmm. Then you got to make it two ways. You got to support their efforts and, um, and they'll look for ways to support your students too. Trisha, I was going to say, I remember when I came to visit last year before everything kind of shut down, when I was able to come to Brennan, one of the things that you had communicated to me that I thought was really important too, is that you were really responsive to your, your community and the ways that, I remember both you and Brittany describing to me that you were really responsive to the ways that they needed that communication. So the, like knowing that where folks in the community went to gather their information, knowing where they were going to look and making sure that you're communicating those ways. So Brittany saying, giving a phone call to every single person. So you were really responsive also saying, this isn't just the way we message things. We're going to be responsive to knowing what our community needs and we're going to communicate in that way to make sure they're getting the information. That's exactly right. Exactly right. I love how you talk about the hats you all wear because that's <laughs> a big job connecting with the community and it yeah. and it's a it's a hat that I see on your head but I also see on Alicia and Brittany's head and and perhaps other parents in your school and in your community. So who backs you up there? Well, I do want to say first of all that um, you know we have hats in extending out to the community but parents also have to wear the hat of caring about their child's education because if if they don't care they're not going to be responsive they're not going to follow up at home the kids get the attitude that you know it doesn't matter my mom never needed math I don't need math you know and we do have some of that right because of the high poverty you do get that attitude with some parents but Alicia is like a golden example of a parent who does care who's actively involved who wants their child to succeed and I think you've seen that with her responsiveness her children have all just excelled here in this environment. And I'm not saying we have 100% of parents like that. We don't, you know, we're striving for that. We work every day trying to connect with those parents who aren't connectable. We just keep trying, right? We keep reaching out. We keep saying, okay, hey, how about this opportunity? You want to come, you know, do this with us? Okay, well, next time, you know, whatever. So just being keyed into where each parent is at and knowing how much you can um, collaborate with them is also helpful. And, if, and I think also if the parent is struggling a little bit or has, is having a little bit of difficulty connecting, that's our job. You know, we have to just kindly and in a warm, supportive way, stay with them, you know, and say, you know, maybe they need to hear, you know, some good stories or some good news about what's going on, but that's our job to stay with them. Well, and I know yeah. that one of the things that when I, when I came in as a new parent, um, the big joke was, so when I first met Brittany, it was Trish introducing me to Brittany as the PTO president and me saying, yeah, I'd like to be on the PTO. And then her just totally blowing me off. Like I, she's like, yeah, whatever, you know. And, yeah, I have uh, to say, I was, I was not working she wasn't the there. at the time. I was just a mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I just have to give you a little background because I wasn't blowing her off, but I had had at least five other parents saying, oh, sure, I'll be on the PTO. And mm -hmm. then they ghost me or, you know, they, they show up <laughs> once and they never come back. And I'm like, okay, great. Another parent that says they want it. And I'm just going to waste my time. <laughs> that was, Brittany, that was it's so like the equivalent of, yeah, yeah, we should get, hang out. Yeah, for let's sure. Go. For sure. sure. Yeah, let's do absolutely. it. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. So, so now at this point, I'm the PTO secretary. There is actually technically nobody else on the board but me, um, you know, and I'm, I just focused on encouraging teachers and staff this year or staff and students this year. And that was, that was PTO this year. Um, but the relationships that build as, you know, a new parent coming in, you know, all teasing aside, Brittany was there. She was supportive. She was, you know, because she had moved into Brennan also, she understood 
um, just what it's like to go from not a small town to a really small town. And at the time when we, we first moved in, not so many families. I mean, we've had a lot of families move in recently, um, but it, most of it was a lot of senior people. Um, when I first got here and I came to the community center, I was told they didn't have kids in Brennan. I'm like, I just dropped three off at the school. I know there's kids in Brennan. They actually uh, said that? <laughs> she did. She actually told me that there weren't kids in Brennan. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> she has now retired and I'll, I have her her position and <laughs> this is a community center. We have kids in Brennan. We yeah, have the big, the big joke everybody. about the community center, it yeah. wasn't a community center, it was a senior center because they did not accept kids in there at the time that I moved in. But Alicia's changing that around too, like making it more community focused and bringing more of the community together. So now we have an in, you know, we can bring even more of the community in. So it's definitely, great. well, and I see that a lot with, um, with the, so in my position at the community center, I see a lot of like the, um, the groups that Trish is getting invited to and, um, you know, all these different organizations in Jefferson County who want to help out, um, you know, what does Brennan need? And, First of all, whenever I say, yes, I work with Tr you know, Trish Bethard, they're like, oh, she's wonderful. And I'm like, yes, she gets Brennan what it needs, you know, definitely. Um, but it, a lot of it is just, we've had people come in and say, as a family, what do you need here in Brennan? Um, that's how we got the Kaleidoscope Play and Learn group for the zero, ages zero to five kids um, back in 2017. Somebody from First Step Family Support came in and said, what do you guys need? And I said, It'd be great if I had a playgroup for my little guy. Um, and then it just kind of morphs into that. Well, and in the um, case of the, like the YMCA swimming lessons that we yeah. got, that was when we were both in PTO before yeah. I worked at the school. And we're like, you know what? Our kids really need to know how to swim. We got little kids. We live on the canal. Yep. There's no swimming anywhere close. I can't drive an hour to go swimming lessons, right? So we, as a PTO, we reached out to the YMCA and swim, you know, different county, but it's still close. And sometimes we, you know, go back and forth. And so we're like, hey, is there any way we could get swimming lessons for our students? We know you do it for the schools up there. You know, can we bus our students up there? So we started that and Trish was open to that. And so we got six swimming lessons at the end of the school year and it took the whole day, but we'd bus all the kids out there in two different shifts and they'd spend some time. They spend, was it half an hour, an hour? I don't remember. They'd spend some time with their swimming lessons and then they'd get bused home. And so they were learning how to swim every year. And, you know, that was because we, we had to go find what we needed and we brought it in to the school. And then, and now Trish has developed a relationship with the local marina that has an outdoor yep. heated pool that, you know, unless I guess it's snowing outside, <laughs> we can just go there. And the YMCA still sends their coaches down and their, um, we provide lifeguards and they send their coaches down to teach the swimming down in our area. So we're kind of, developing as we go it starts small we do what we can and we just kind of yep. grow from there and do you know just keep building yeah i think it's just a constant as, as you look at the hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. we're trying to just reel in everything we can to fill those lower levels so that our kids can learn and yeah. uh, you know wh whether it's the smile mobile or the book mobile or counseling or after school programs and summer programs um all of those things will fill in the bottom of that triangle so our kids can learn and um, and they're doing it. And so it's, and, you know, and we put them all in the classroom and we flood that classroom with support. Oh, and, and I will say that even that, after, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and the teachers and whatever support, whatever training we give to the teachers about inclusive practices, about any topic, um, Everyone gets it. Everyone who touches kids gets that same training. It's not special for the teacher, it's for everyone. And so um, I think that's been kind of one of our, it's kind of our secret sauce is training everyone. Everyone's a teacher, everyone's important. And, um, and then reeling in the, what we need to, to fill the bottom of that triangle, you know. Yeah, this has been wonderful, y'all. I think that we've really hit on a lot of really important parts um, and points. So with a f we have a few minutes um, before we have to wrap it up here. Um, so I, I wanna know, is there anything that you wanna throw out there that, that we haven't hit on? Uh, and if not, I'd really love to hear just one kind of how you would quickly summarize the impact that it's had on you 
your community, your school kind of, um, where, whatever lens you're coming from. Alicia, I think you're coming from a really interesting lens there because you're uh, a parent and connected to the school and connected to the community center. So I would love to hear specifically from you on how you would summarize that impact, but um, I would love to hear from any of you on any last points you wanna wrap up. You know, I was just talking to somebody yesterday about this and, and we were talking about, you know, if you do stuff because of what you are, you, you can stumble, but if you do it because of your why, um, and my why is being all about the community. And it's because of my beginning relationship at the Brennan School and seeing community be talked, walked, shown, shared, that relationship built there, that, that helped me as, an, as a newcomer um, feel safe and um, a part of something bigger. And so that made it where I was able to, you know, I, I okay, I have a lot of kids, but I'm not really good with a lot of kids. <laughs> um, and so doing the 4-H after school program was really stretching my comfort zone. Um, but being with Brennan and being a part of that, I, I felt supported enough that I knew that I would succeed because I had Trish as a backup. I had Brittany as a backup. I mean, all the teachers there, all the years of experience and they care. Mm -hmm. it's, they're not just there because, you know, it's a job. It's a community. It's a family. And um, yeah, I, I love Brennan. <laughs> I love that. I think that was perfect. I did, I wanted to say what, um, when Trish was talking about, um, you know, the kids are there and they're doing it and they're learning. I think our biggest impact is the continued growth we see. We won that big award from OSPI, but that's not where our growth stopped. I mean, our kids are still growing in math this year. I mean, we, we were lucky enough to go in person four days a week, almost the entire year. There was a couple of weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas. We went two days a week on and off. We've had a Wednesday that's remote learning day for the year. So it's just been four full days in class and one remote learning day, which we all know is less effective. <laughs> but we still can see, continue to see extremely high growth in math, in the ELA, right? I've got students in math that have, that are in the lower, the, you know, the little red bands that you see, they're in the lower third percentile, 10th percentile, but they're growing. They have 99% growth this year, you know, and they're just continuing to just keep going no matter what band they're in, as long as they're growing, we count that as a win and they're successful and they get good grades as long as they're growing. You know, it's not, it's not standards mastery. It's, it's growth. So I like celebrate point. the wins. You celebrate their, their attainments, their learning, they're growing, you know, they're learning as much or more as anybody else because they have to catch up with the gaps. Right. So you celebrate that and you you make it a success instead of saying, well, you're still not up to speed. You're still missing this and this. It's the strength-based, hey, you're doing great. You're learning. You're yeah. closing that gap. And so you're successful and that's it. I think I you know, one of the things I've seen kind of change and morph over the this six or seven years I've been here is uh, the general atmosphere. I think, you know, Brittany's, above Brittany's head is sort of our, our, unofficial motto is just always kind always and um so we tend to have happier students that way and we really have you know i've, I've been around I've, I've been doing this for a while we don't have grouchy parents they're happy you know um and uh so i think that that whole atmosphere is, is something that's noted by people that are coming and going i hear it all the time and so um i think that's been a great change and it creates a really warm, comfortable learning place for kids. Yeah, I really appreciate that community partnerships for Brennan is not an afterthought. It is built into the framework. It is the system, it is the structure, it, it is the community and the family. Um, and I think that is a really important way for education and schools to continue to move. So I think this was a really important talk and I really appreciate you all. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. <laughs>